Good morning. Good morning. Glad you could be with us this morning as we uh, take a little time to walk through a couple of the lessons today. Today we're going to first start with the epistle lesson that uh, Pastor Rushi uh, is proclaiming today in uh, our 8 and 1030 services. And then we'll take a look at the gospel lesson that I will be uh, be preaching at, at the 1045. So with that, uh, why don't we, Pastor Rushi, if you would, why don't we begin with a, a word of prayer? Okay, Absolutely. You would. Uh, Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us this day of, of Sabbath, this day of being in your word. Uh, Lord, we, we pray your blessings upon our worship and our study here today. Uh, help us to always grow in our faith and our love towards you and our neighbor. Help us to, to see your word for what it is, your very word handed down to us for our life. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. This morning, uh, the uh, epistle lesson during this season, these last couple weeks, there's been this ongoing uh, reading from Paul's letter to the church at mm -hmm. Philippi. And uh, what's interesting about this letter is, is that unlike a lot of the other letters, or we call it like Romans and stuff like that, Paul isn't really addressing so many problematic things like he does in the others. He's, it's just kind of a joyful encouragement right. letter. It's it's a neat uh, it's a neat thing. What you've been you preached on this now three weeks now the two weeks uh, already, two weeks yeah. yeah. Well, we've we've started the uh, the Bible class as well, right. uh, going through Philippians. Um, so we, we did two weeks, uh, and then last week I I preached on. Uh, the epistle lesson, uh, not here at Trinity, but, yeah, but rather at, at home. Uh, and uh, I drew the comparison uh, because I was I was home and my family was there. Uh, the church in Philippi is kind of that that brother that does everything right. Uh, that uh, uh, they're just they're really really good at what they're doing, and right. you know, they're not they've they've got their trials and their their tribulations, but they're not um, as aggressively persecuted as some of the other churches right. are. Um, they're not falling into these false doctrines and it really is just this joyous letter and it's it's a shorter letter um, but you just get that sense of joy that Paul has throughout the entire uh, the entire time that he's he's writing that he's just he's filled with joy that he gets to, to write this letter to this church and you know his, his heart is breaking because he can't be there with them yeah. but yeah at the same time you know he he's he said hey you know uh, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering if, if my life is forfeit right now I'm one. I get to be with with Christ, and that's to gain. And, and two, that I know that you guys have have carried through with this faith and, and, and the like. And so it is just a beautiful beautiful letter uh, to the church as as a whole. And like you said, it's not full of as many <coughs> um, corrections of false doctrine as uh, some of the other ones are. And yet he holds di the the fundamental teachings of right. the scriptures and salvation uh, are are held out very prominently. Well, how about we go ahead and uh, let's uh, let's read. We're going to begin in the middle of uh, uh, verse four in chapter three here, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, since you're the the guy, uh, shall we say, <laughs> doing some expository on it for us, uh, I'll go ahead and read it, and then we'll we'll delve into it here. Okay. So Paul writes. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness which uh, excuse me the righteousness from god that depends on faith that i may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death that by any means possible i may attain the resurrection of the dead 
Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So far the text. All right. Now, as you as you uh, get into this and so forth, where kind of where's Paul? Where's Paul coming from? What is he trying to uh, kind of hold out for them? So, for me, when I read this, it's hard to not just think of him laying out his bona fides. And then he, he says, look, I've done all of these things that, you know, I'm a, a Hebrew amongst Hebrews. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. You know, I'm a, I was the persecutor of the church. I, all of these things. And he takes them all. He takes his resume, if you will, wads it up and throws it in the trash can. He says, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't, none of that is, is anywhere near the glory and joy and honor that it is to be in fellowship with Christ Jesus. Okay, now I want to I want to I want to push on that. Mm-hmm. Now, is this just something was an intellectual discussion that he decided, oh, the, this other stuff just isn't worth it? What made it in his mind? Because he uses that word there, rubbish. Mm-hmm. It, it says here, I believe that the way he describes it, he says, I count everything as loss, and I think the word in Greek is actually rubbish. And so forth. So why does he consider all of that stuff rubbish? Well, it's it's the, the temporal things, you know, that compared to the, the glory of the eternal life that is in Christ Jesus. And it goes back to his um, his other letters where he's mentioning that, you know, the to to live in Christ uh, or to excuse me, to die in Christ is, is gain. You know, that is that is what our, our lack of a better term, our goal kind of is, is that that we put our stake in in that identity. Okay. There. And I, I'm really I want to push on this because it really lies at the heart of because the interesting part of it is is when he considers them rubbish rubbish, it's not because he put it through his mental processes that said, well, you know, as I value things and stuff like that, that's pretty weak compared to him. I think what he, at least what I take away from this, him being so schooled in the law that he was, is basically what he came to realize is because they were a work of man, they were his works, earthly works, earthly things. Like you said, the temporal, sin had cursed them all. Yeah. And no matter how great they were in the eyes of of Paul or the eyes of the then modified Jewish religion that Jesus himself said they'd set aside the word for the traditions of men. Every one of them was cursed by sin and touched by sin and therefore in and of themselves were rubbish because they would end up in the same dust where he would end up. And here Christ comes along and it becomes Christ's work. Mm -hmm. If if you get what I mean by that. Is that it's it's because a lot of people today it's very easy for us to where I'm coming from with that is it's very easy for us to to just assess in our own mind whether something's worth it or not mm-hmm. and and clearly Paul through the revelation of Christ to him suddenly now he sees himself and his works under the law and he sees Christ and I I just think it's it's an important thing that that his consideration of their value was by virtue of the enlightenment, both of what the law actually says, but also of the surpassing success that Christ gives him yeah. and so forth. So, mm-hmm. um, and I, I will say, I, I think that the, there's also value in Paul presenting this for a reason, um, basically to, uh, to, to 
issue a challenge of, of look, these are my credentials. You know, if anyone wants to debate with me, you know, say, oh, you know, you're just throwing out the law because you couldn't keep it. No, here, I'm a Pharisee. You know, oh, you know, you just, you got cold feet. No, I used to persecute the church. You know, no, like he's got all of these. He, he basically, you know, he, it, the, the flop in, in, in uh, Texas Hold'em came out and it, it threw, you know, uh, uh, you know, some guy's got a full house. Well, he's got the fourth card of the, of the match right there. And he goes, all right, you know, here we go. You know, this is, you, you want to, you want to, you know, measure accomplishments. Let's measure accomplishments. But even then these things that we hold value in, in this world, and you and I have talked about this before, uh, when doing some sermon prep about the value of this world, as opposed to God's value, um, the, and the, the value of, of our works versus yes. God's works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in terms of that, these works that we can hold value in in this world, they they eventually dissolve and, and disappear with us. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I'm, every time I, I, I read this passage, I'm reminded of the poem uh, 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 Ozymandias. You know, look upon my works, ye mighty, in despair, uh, says the plaque at the bottom of the eroded statue. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and, and even the great works of, uh, I might have just uh, given away a little bit of my... Uh, <laughs> sermon illustration, but, uh, you know, the idea is that we have these earthly things that we value in and they will eventually fade away. And, and as you said, they're corrupted by sin. Even, even Paul in, in his work of, you know, upholding the law, all of that, it was corrupted by sin nonetheless. And Hey, I'm going to give this all away. This is all, this is all garbage compared to the faith and life in Christ that, that is mine. One of the things too, that I, I, I think is a, I don't know if it, it, I don't, I can't say that this was his plan in doing that, but another thing that to be heard here is that the lowliest convert who has faith in Christ, Paul's telling him, you and I are on the same plane. Mm -hmm. You and I, we stand the same shoulder to shoulder before the Lord. And so it, 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 it really allows for the true, uh, uh, equality in the eyes of God, by the grace of God, that all are loved equally, all are redeemed equally. One is not greater or or lesser than the other, and so forth. And again, like you say, he takes his eyes off of what he's accomplished and focuses them on Christ mm-hmm. for him. And every the lowliest believer, their faith is what Christ has accomplished for me. And suddenly now, this is the Apostle Paul in I actually stand before God in the same righteousness that he did. And I, I, I think it's just a, it's a neat encouragement to people who, well, I could never measure it. Well, it's not about you measuring up to me, like you mm-hmm. said. Right. You know, so I, yeah, it's really good. Uh, now, uh, any words in this that uh, kind of um, pop out at you? Uh, in this, uh, as we go on through this this lesson here and so forth, um, it, I, I want to jump to um, verses uh, ten and eleven, uh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Um, and it just, yeah, that to me, you know, kind of speaks to why he's willing to, to give this all away, you know, in, in you know, to, to count it as loss because, you know, he's saying there again, one day I'm going to die. And as Paul's writing this, he's in prison. So he doesn't know if that day might be next week. It could be months on down. It, it might be, you know, sure, uh, sooner rather than later that, that, that actually is, is what comes. Um, but He's putting all of his stake in the resurrection, and I, I think that it's just the, it, the beautiful connection that he draws to the trash of this world in his eye versus the glory of. And he really, there's there. It's it's something I find I find fascinating when it comes to like the promise. As as I think of this, is we all eagerly and wantingly believe in the good news promises of God. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. But for some reason, we, we, we put no faith in the law or the negative promises of God. You understand what it is? Yeah. You know, it's like the, you know, you know, yeah, I like these promises. God's with me. God's going. I have his favor, so forth and so on. 
But you know, the like the from from the uh, Old Testament last week. Well, the soul who sins shall die. That's a promise. Okay, and it's like, well, I, I I don't think about that, or I don't I don't want to hear that one, and so forth. Well, parallel to that, one of the things I find fascinating is we all want to share in Jesus' resurrection. We all want to share in His victory. We all want to share in all of these things. But one of the ironic thing Paul says here is he wants to share in the suffering. Now, I, I you know I don't think he's you know uh, uh, kind of searching out, hey, I'm going to suffer for the sake of suffering, which sadly became uh, something the, the medieval church began to embrace is suffering was your way of doing it. But what I think he's eager to do here is to stay with Christ, be with Christ, walk with Christ. And and if I got to suffer, then I, I'm eager to suffer because I'm even more eager to stay with Christ. Mm -hmm. And if suffering comes, then then that's what happens. And, and it's not suffering for the sake of suffering. It's suffering for the sake of Christ and those with whom we might share him. Yeah. And, and to share in his death and so forth. It's not that he was looking to be crucified, but he was looking to give up his life, don't you think, in, in service of the salvation yeah. uh, of others. You know, it, it, was, um, it, it brings to mind Jesus' own words that, you know, you will suffer and men will hate you for my name's sake, but blessed are you. Uh, when they do hate you, because you you are doing the work of the Father who sent me, you know, and and that that's what Paul is 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 taking to heart, you know, that we don't get to just pick and choose the promises that we 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 hold to and, and keep, you know. It'd be really great if we could not have to suffer for the sake of Christ, you know. If we if we got the 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 glory of the resurrection without the suffering and and death that that has to come first. Well, but And it fits well, the idea that he says, to run the race laid out for me. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's not about the speed, but sometimes the course does take us through the valley of the right. shadow of death, if you mm -hmm. will. It takes us through those sufferings and not just suffering for, for the sake of Christ, suffering in manifold ways. Mm -hmm. And while you may be suffering for cancer it, at the hands of cancer and the like, this is certainly a form of suffering. Whether you suffer for Christ in the midst of it or not is whether you continue to cling to him and bear witness right. to him through that. And so it's kind of that race laid out is is we jump to the winning of it rather than kind of the course right. that it will travel and so mm -hmm. forth. And uh, it's just a, it, it's an interesting thing that one of the things, and I'll, I'll let you, what do you take away from the race part of it? Well, the, for me, the race part, you know, we, we, again, we so often want to jump to, you know, crossing the finish line and getting our laurels and, you know, oh, you know, congratulations, you know, celebrating. Uh, but we're not looking at the course as it's laid out. You know, we're, we want to imagine it as um, that 100 yard or 100 meter dash, uh, you know, that real short, it's fast, it's over, you know, we get our crown and everything, we're, we're great. Uh it might be an ultra marathon and it, it might be a long drawn out thing where we are suffering and, and, and just, uh, what, what is in the, the New York marathon, um, heartbreak Hill. Uh, you know, sometimes we got to climb heartbreak Hill, you know, that, that, that Hill, at, I think it's at mile 20 or, or so, my marathon knowledge is very low, but I, I know of the idea of heartbreak Hill is that's where most people quit. And it, yep. and the thing is that, that they can't figure out, you know, why there are people quit it's so close i mean you've already ran 20 miles it's really not that much further to go right but at that point people just give up and we might be going up our own heartbreak hill you know in this this race with christ right now and the you know it it, it can feel daunting you know and i'm uh, i've never run a marathon so i can't speak to any uh first-hand experience i have friends who have and they always say you know you hit you hit that wall and you have to make that decision are, are you going to persevere and endure and suffer for the sake of what is to come or are you going to back out right and you know you might feel better in that moment but you wake up that next morning and, and you're going to regret giving up isn't that the place where you you hit the wall where you're on that threshold of your endorphins kicking in and allowing you to mm -hmm. actually move past the pain or the anguish and continue to persevere with with renewed vigor and renewed energy and so forth. Um, 
One of the things that I, I find fascinating with regard to this race, though, is in your baptism, you've already crossed the finish line in Christ. Exactly. So it's, it's not about winning it. And it always reminds me when uh, three years back or so, uh, my son Isaac uh, uh, did, because of his spina bifida, he did seated shot put his freshman year at uh, Toledo Christian. And uh, went down to state, and he actually qualified for state. He broke a couple of the records for Northwest Ohio, seated shot put of throwing and stuff like Went down to competition and so forth, and he uh, he took sixth in the state of Ohio at uh, the state games. What was interesting is he was told that he had sixth place. There would be a medal and everything else uh, awarded to him. But it would not be where the race, where the throwing where the field was, where the competition took place. He would have to travel somewhere else to receive the medal, which is what they did. They took us, located us in a completely different place and so forth. And so the thing that you have in your baptism is the race is won now. But from here to there, you take your victory and you literally share the laurels of it with everybody between here and there. Yeah. And there's going to be some some people who who will will not like it, will will badmouth or will whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it's a it's it's just a fascinating thing that this this race it's not so much about winning as much as it is the course. The course. Yeah. And and I was even going to you know make the the connection there, you know, in our our daily life. I mean, when, like I said, we can be going through that moment of difficulty, you know, to continue to build upon the analogy of running the race, you know, that, that there's those water stops along the way, but we have that water of holy baptism that, that washes over us. And, but we also get the reminder of what has been done for us. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we get that reminder every week in worship when we hear the, the proclamation of of the word and we hear the the absolution of our sins and that reminder of what Christ has done in those waters for us that it continues to work within us and, and make us a new man every single day. Right. It is the refreshment of that, that cool water on the And it frees us from running the race to win it, which mm -hmm. Paul that's what Paul's throwing out. Right. Everything I did to win, I didn't win. It's basically rubbish when it comes to winning mm -hmm. and so forth. But the fascinating thing, it, it like, this race is, is one of those that I find fascinating. It's kind of like uh, uh, my, my daughter Natalie is, is an artist and so forth. Like in one of the classes she took, you had to draw by placing the pin down and never lifting it up. You couldn't lift it up. You yeah. had to just, and when you think about that race given you to run, it's a fascinating thing how the, where do you run it to? Well, who's the first, you know, you run first to the Lord in your prayers. You wake up in the morning. Who's the first person you meet? All of these places, these people you'll go to, they're all part of the course for that particular day. And the, and the various vocations you have tend to be, you know, if you will, the map journey. And the interesting part is, is you're entering and traveling all of this as much to show the to see the beauty of the landscape, you're there to show the beauty of the Lord who mm -hmm. would bless the landscape of the people's lives and stuff. So, any other takeaways from this that you? Uh... Um, no, I think we we went to where I was going to jump next, and that was talking about the 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 race and the um, the prize that is uh, you know that is is there for us. It's been won. It is that that waters of baptism, and, and it's it's been given to us. Uh, we didn't even finish the the race uh, and and in first place, but we still got to to receive the the winner's prize. Um, but uh, I like the as he finishes this. Uh, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call. The upward call. Uh, again, it's always the idea of where Paul also says, you know setting your mind on the things of heaven rather than on the things of earth. And it, it echoes the reality that whatever we're going through in this life, wherever the course has taken us in the race, um, we, have a, we have a higher and a better destination 
and uh, then then the moment that uh, you know we're journeying in and stuff. Because I, I read an interesting thing that talked about how it was an interesting way they put it in terms of the blessings of our baptism and the victory concept is that uh, by virtue of our baptism. The Lord has set us free to come to those times in the course to which our life is traveled, where all we see is a dark tunnel. And Christ said, that's okay, you can go ahead and enter it. The, the It's open on the other end. You already have the exit on the other side as a part of you, so just enter in. It's like you already have the victory, uh, and so forth. And it, it's a, it's just a, it's a glorious text. Uh, what one word rings out out of this text for you? A word or two words, would you say? It's hard to read this and not trash or rubbish or loss or you know that that's what's what jumps out to you because it it it, it doesn't click in in our brain you know when we we want to build ourselves up you know and and prop ourselves up on our accomplishments and and the fact that that's yeah there was a a, a, a really good uh, I, I don't know who wrote wrote it uh, but it it said. Uh, uh, my life uh, as a garbage dump. Mm -hmm. And and it just emphasized the reality that by virtue of sin, we and, and what we do is, is made to be garbage, and yet that's the place Christ comes to live mm -hmm. and comes to set up his kingdom in the midst of that because he will not allow us to go the way of the rubbish yep. and, and stuff. So, yeah, very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, let's. Uh, we're going to take a look at the gospel lesson for today. Uh, this is another one of the parables uh, uh, of Jesus. He is. This is during the period of Holy Week. He is. Um, he's in the temple area, and the Pharisees are panicking because. Uh, he's raised Lazarus. Everybody knows about it. He's had that triumphal entry on Palm Sunday and uh, the like. And the, the Pharisees are trying to find some way to entrap him, some way to, to, to either, if they can't control him, shut him down. Last week, we saw him share the, the parable of the two sons when they ask about authority and so forth. And this is all done in light of the authority, the idea. They're asking, who authorized you to do these things and say these things? Who authorized you? And as we take a look at the parable, because what he does is he doesn't let them get away. As soon as he tells them the parable of the son and so forth, and he asks, which of the two did the will of the father? Well, they answer, well, the one. And now he brings another one in. In fact, Luke says, uh, I love how Luke, in, in telling this one, he says flat to him, he says, oh, let me uh, let me tell you another parable. You know, it's like, uh, don't go away. I'm not done with you yet. But all of this is, is, is a desperate plea on Jesus' part, not to in their face, but to do two things, to call them to repentance, but because they see the Son has come not to destroy, but to reestablish the relationship. Now, a lot of times the... The interesting thing is the parable of the tenants or the wicked tenants. And uh, in fact, some of the old uh, uh, King James was the husbandman. Uh, it was the, 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 man who, the man who took care of the, the fields and so forth. So um, would you mind reading that? We're picking up here uh, for this one. We're going, excuse me, uh, uh, we're going to go verses 33 through 44 here. So would you mind reading it? Absolutely. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent out other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the tenants? 
They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eye. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Thank you. All right. Um, as he says here, he addresses him again. He goes, here another parable uh, before you get going away. And a, a parable, the interesting thing about parables, they're like proverbs. Mm -hmm. They, 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 they speak or name a truth that's always been true and will always be true. Okay. And the interesting thing is, uh, the master who, of the house who planted a vineyard, uh, the kingdom of God is, is referred to as a vineyard in many, many places throughout the old Testament, even in, in the new Testament in, uh, uh, the Jesus referring to himself as the vine and, mm -hmm. You are the branches and so forth. So, but this echoes back to uh, the uh, Isaiah chapter five, where God is making his case against the Israelites of that day, and he lays out the image that uh, of what the what he basically did. He took, he made a vineyard, created a place, planted the choicest vines, everything else. And when he came to look for it, now that one he came to look for it, and all he found was wild grapes. In other words, they had, they had rebelled. And he's echoing the journey of bringing people out of Israel, conquering the promised land, setting it up, setting up a kingdom, everything else, temple worship, everything's ready. The tower's there and so forth. And yet everything done to protect and provide for the vines, the vines still went wild. Okay. Now Jesus changes it up here a little bit. So he's using the analogy of the of the, the vineyard, which they get that idea of it and so forth. Uh, but he, he changes that here. Uh, now this is one of those, if when you hear this parable, what, uh, just sticking with the parable before we get to the stones and stuff like that, what is it that, that kind of stands out with you on this one? Uh, the thing I've always, and, and trying to not make the the jump ahead and letting the text actually speak and why did the the owner of the vineyard go all right send servants send servants after that second time send the son and 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 just thinking well they didn't respect my servants but my son that they're going to respect him that's the thing that i've always wrestled with with this text is that jump to me doesn't it, it it's it sticks me it sticks me why he's he makes that that jump next beyond okay why don't i i'll go down there myself and i'll you know shake these guys up out, out and everything and um the interesting part is is and that's what he always does with parables he takes an ordinary situation that everybody can get into. Yeah, I understand that kind of relationship. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, because it at the time Jerusalem had a lot of 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 wealthy people in it who owned vineyards that were out and away from more up towards Mount Carmel, which Carmel means vineyard of God. They had these vineyards, and they would live in Jerusalem, and they go and collect, and you know, mm -hmm. and, and so forth and so on. So this is a standard operating procedure. Where it goes south, as you point out, and this is something I was reading uh, yesterday, is that uh, we think if we think the the real insult to the uh, to the uh, the the owner of the vineyard and so forth, uh, the master, would be what they did to his son. Yet in that culture, treating one of his servants in such a way was automatically a sentence of death at his hands. And, and the interesting part is, is, and that's really the interesting thing, is what they've done demands a law response. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't he let the law have his way, have its way? And that's really the hook in understanding God as 
God's, God's first work is to be merciful and be gracious. Because it's for God, as, as to say that God is love, as we hear John say in his first letter, is to say that God, his entire being is bound up in doing and providing for the welfare of the one with whom he has a relationship. Mm-hmm. And he has a relationship with mankind. And to just let the law have its way with, with the sinners that have done this is to not really look out for their welfare. It's to look out for your own. And so as, as much as we can be shocked at the behavior of the tenants in this vineyard, I agree with you. The more shocking thing is that um, the, the behavior of the landowner, and it's only shocking uh, if you don't know the gospel, if you don't know God as he's revealed himself mm-hmm. to be. I think of this going out there to them, sending the sun out to them, all the way back into the Garden of Eden. Right. The word was, you know, you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. And yet, here comes God, you know, not out there to die, you know. And even Jesus, when he comes, John the Baptist, when when are you going to crack the whip here? You know, you wonder if that's in the back of his mind. Like, are you really the one to come? You know, where's the the cracking of the whip? And and the interesting part is in, in all of this is that, what, what we don't get is what's the most important thing to the master? Believe it or not, this is, this is really where, where it, it's missed so often. The most important thing to this master isn't the vineyard, isn't the fruit, isn't even justice. It's about having a relationship to the people he gave that vineyard to. Mm -hmm. And he'll pay any price to have that, even the price of his son. And and that, and and see, when it's such a striking contrast, especially today Mm -hmm. in our cancel culture. In our cancel culture, as... uh, I was reading a thing uh, earlier this morning where uh, this one uh, this one uh, uh, actor had basically said with the crew that uh, well, basically, if you don't support these things, then goodbye, be gone. Uh, you know, and 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 see what's what's striking in those moments is if people have to either conform to you or get out you become the most important thing. Where God, God's desire is he doesn't conform to you, but what he does is he basically has his son conform to you to change you, mm-hmm. to reestablish a relationship. And one of the striking things in sending the son that I, I had never saw this before, but when you think father and the son, is the father in sending the son is about the future. If you think about that, the son yeah. isn't there just to settle past accounts. The son is there to deal with the past accounts and establish a relationship for an ongoing future. Yeah. And so forth. And the interesting part is in in stoning him, they actually are you know, taking him outside and stoning him. They actually believe they're providing a future for themselves, mm-hmm. and um, it, it's it's a it's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting turn in all of this. And the bizarre part is, is even as Jesus is saying this to them and the like, um, the most striking part of that is that this is the son of the owner actually talking to the husbandman in that place. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, a, it, it's just a, an interesting thing, and they, they, they cannot grasp that that's what's really taking place. One of the things I find interesting is how Jesus did the last parable. 
but especially he did this parable, it echoes to Nathan's confrontation of David. Mm -hmm. He sets up a scenario in which, here's what it is, what do you think the judgment should be? Now, Nathan never gets to the point of asking David that. David just bang, announces right. it. Jesus invites them to announce what they believe the master ought to do or will do to them. Mm -hmm. And they even answer it. And they perceive that he's talking about them. Yeah. And it's uh, it's an interesting, because uh, uh, as soon as he's, and he says, you know, that he'll, uh, in verse 41, he will put those wretch, miser wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits of the season. Now, this is argued that um, God took it from the Jews and gave it to the Gentiles. Do you think that's a fair charge in the idea that after Christ... Mm. It's one of those things I, I I can I can track where they're where they're going, but I I don't know if I would make that no that connection personally. I, I agree. I don't think you can. Mm -hmm. um, I think what he's talking about here is the new tenants are those who have that relationship with God through faith in Christ, Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's the basis of a new relationship as established completely apart from the previous tenant and so forth. And and that's the cool part is each of us is a tenant mm -hmm. born a wretch and he comes <laughs> and, you know what I'm saying, and establishes. Now, one of the things I had heard about this particular passage was a way to see this in terms of the, um, the, the image that's played here is that in, in gathering the vines and setting up the, the vineyard and so forth, it referred to God's taking uh, Israel out of Egypt, mm -hmm. bringing them out, moving them in, setting them up in the land. But the interesting part is, is the time when the master goes away was the time when God's manifestations of himself had ceased in Israel. The idea of the pillar of cloud by day, fire by night, the, the smoke with the temple or with the tabernacle once the temple was established. And now at that particular point, the people lived only by the words of the covenantal relationship. There was no big, overwhelming, threatening presence that always reminded you, oh, 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 God's bigger than me right here. And they just had the word. Mm -hmm. and, and while the word was enough, it, it got to where they... They were not in the word. They forgot the word mm -hmm. and suddenly imagined themselves to be as big or bigger than the master. Now, any thoughts on that? I'd, I'd never seen it put that way before. No, I I mean, the thing that I've always thought about is, is okay, you know, obviously the master is, is God and he sends his servants. Servants read prophets and the people rebelled against the, the prophets and killed them and everything, but... Uh, I think that's a, a, a an even starker comparison of this is really what it, you know, that it is not just that, all right, you are the vineyard and then you are also the, the certain, you know, that this is the land that I have given you. I've set you up. I've taken care of everything. I have made this so that all you have to do is abide by what the contract that we have cut between us mm -hmm. says. Yeah. And, and the prophet's. The prophet's coming. But one of the other things that I find fascinating is when we think of God coming for the master coming for his share, mm -hmm. one of the things I think is is critically important that is forgotten there is God, it, through Isaiah and the like, talked about how God came seeking his share through the mouths of the widows and the poor and the orphaned. Mm -hmm. And they were sent away empty. Okay, they were sent away empty. Then the prophets come and make the case for the poor, the widowed, and the like, and they're beaten. Some of them are killed. Yeah. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and see, it's an interesting thing that the other thing about this, though, that the parable has going forward is just remember, we're merely tenants in this vineyard. Right. And 
And the most striking thing is, is what share of you does God come to get from you if you work in his vineyard? He comes to get all of you. Because that's how he does two things. He keeps the relationship right, but he also then, by having all of you, produces the great fruit, yeah. not for him, but for those who have need mm -hmm. around you and stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then he well, flips it. One of these things that almost looks like a, like a, a way you change things up here. You're talking about a vineyard. Now you're talking about the, the bricks and the stones here. Because he moves on to when they when he announces that it's going to be taken away and so forth. Uh, 42, he says, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected uh, has become the cornerstone. Uh, this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous uh, in our eyes. Mm -hmm. And then he sets it flat out. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people producing its fruits. Now he flips back to the vine. And then he says, and the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And it's kind of like mixing metaphors. Right. <laughs> you kind of get the wine press idea of, you know, you know if you're not going to bear fruit, then we're going to just yep. toss you and break you. And... The interesting part is, is the, uh, with the, the builders rejecting it, it literally means that that they tested this stone. And the reason they rejected it is it did not serve their purposes mm -hmm. and so forth. And what's interesting is the Lord comes along and, uh, you know, the builders rejected it. But then you go by the psalm, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders build in vain. Right. And and that's basically what they were doing. They were building their future and their relationship with God and with with the the vineyard they had, and it was totally devoid mm -hmm. of the of the right relationship. What do you take away from the? Uh, we get the idea of the the cornerstone, always setting the lines, mm -hmm. determining everything. It becomes the measuring thing by which all lines and contours are set. Okay. My question is, is what do you do? And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. What do you take away from that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one that's... Yeah, I mean, and I know in, um, there's always the note with this one, and, and at least it's in, in my my Bible here, that um, we have some of our manuscripts that, that omit this verse, and I wonder if it's, if that's the history of this verse because people don't know how to, how to compute it and come and, uh, and make it make it work so they just kind of chop it off. But, but trying to think through and, and work through that verse in, in my head... Um, the thing I, I look to is um, in relation to the law. Mm -hmm. You know, that the law of, you know, the law was what, what Christ fulfilled perfectly. And that was, you know, he was rejected by those, although he had the, the perfection. So he became the cornerstone. And then um, I guess to me, it's, it's the rejection of, of Christ and, 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 and what he has done in his sacrifice will, will break you. And it, you know, you know, if it, um, it's the stumbling block to the wise and that's going to break you or it will, it will fall on you and crush you. And I, 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 I apologize. I didn't really heavily unpack this particular turn here, but the one thing, if you set the chief cornerstone, you set the cornerstone, everything is governed around that if you will right. all right is for the stone to fall on you is you have taken the place where the cornerstone ought to be mm -hmm. if you understand what i mean you set yourself up as the one who determines the lines of right and wrong it goes this way that way or whatever in that sense to fall over the stone is when you try to move the stone to allow yourself to have some place 
where the stone okay. was. Well, you can have this much of the corner, but I'm going to set the other lines. Mm -hmm. But they both deal with the idea of of one who displaces the stone, as the builders did, because they set themselves up as the cornerstone, mm -hmm. because they were the determiners. But then you also have those throughout time who've always come and tried to add something to God's yeah. word. And so now it's it's a Jesus plus this or a little of God's word plus, and that's where you you it can't happen because you will fall over it. Mm -hmm. And the reason, and again, the reason you fall over it is when you begin to make yourself so big, as the as the as the proverb says, let him who thinks he stand take care lest he fall. Is when you make yourself that big, the winds of the world are gonna blow and you will fall over. That stone, because that ain't moving. Mm -hmm. That ain't moving. It's the stone is there for you to rest upon, not to lean on because you're side by side him, but rest upon. And that's what they forgot is that everything depends upon that resting relationship, you know, on mm -hmm. him, and and so forth. And that's why you know you think of the the the. Uh, the man who built his house upon the sand yeah. versus, and so it's just a, it's an interesting uh, turn on those things, but usually it falls on the one who's put himself in that place and it will, the, and the person will fall over it who tries moving it out of the way to take part of the place because it, 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 why did they fall? It won't be moved. Cause you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Is, yeah. I'll shove you over what, sorry, it's, it's coming back. It, it's not mm -hmm. moving. And yeah. stuff. So, but uh, good stuff. Very good stuff. And again, Jesus' goal here is not like you say. It's it just makes our law just kind of like this. <laughs> right. But he's desperately trying to get them to repent. Yeah. He wants an ongoing relationship mm -hmm. with them. And it's it's like you know no 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 thanks no thanks. And all of this while and and that's the most fascinating thing is is in crucifying him they are literally literally removing him from being the cornerstone and putting their own and putting themselves yeah. in that place yeah. and and so forth so but uh, again it's it's a call to repentance it's closing in on the end of the church year the end times mm -hmm. and so forth and that's that's why these texts kind of focus on that that end time because yeah. Jesus has met the judgment for us and without without him without it, seeking that that relationship with the son and so forth of um, you know the vineyard will be taken away right. and one of the things i love with the image i was reading on the vineyard i thought it was the vineyard the the uh, the a vine and it was just the kind of way to put it we don't think of a vine as a tree but technically it's a tree right that instead of uh, we always think of it climbing an arbor no no, really what it does is it just spreads out over everything. Mm -hmm. Because we, we tie it to an arbor right. to maximize yeah. and so forth. But one of the things that they're always tying them up for is they want them to have maximum sun. Well, if you let it sprawl, you know, it's just a fascinating mm -hmm. thing. But instead of just being something that's solitary, it covers the land. And as we reach out with Christ, we seek to uh, share the fruit abundantly around. Yeah. So, but any other thoughts? No, I... I got nothing else to add to the the conversation on on this passage. It's it's a beautiful passage, um, but uh, I'm not. I felt more pulled towards the the epistle this week, and uh, you Little, felt more pulled to, towards this. And, and hey, we'll we'll kind of cover the gamut amongst the the services this week. Which well, the good Lord willing, because it's His word, the people <laughs> exactly, will be fed. Exactly, will be fed. Uh, the a uh, uh, couple things to keep in mind. Uh, this week, uh, we do have uh, uh, Pastor Clamola's Bible study ongoing with Jeremiah uh, tomorrow night, uh, Monday. Keep that in mind as we go forward. Also, on uh, Wednesday morning, we are continuing our study, What Happens Between Death and the Resurrection in the Luther Room at uh, 9.45 to 11 a.m. And, of course, we have our Wednesday night services as well. Something to look into if you want to do... Uh, some devotions with your children is 
you'll find a link to what we call memory minutes. And in these memory minutes, each of the pastors, we do about a four to seven minute devotion uh, based on the memory work that uh, the kids in our day school are going through. And it'd be a great thing to have a discussion with your kids on, we're going through the commandments right now and so forth. And it just be a little something to help uh, you with uh, your spiritual growth with your kids, walking with your kids and kind of creating a conversation about yeah. those. And if you'd like a copy of the actual uh, uh, weekly focus uh, to have in your home, you can contact the uh, school office and we can send one of you a PDF of those lessons and so forth. They're, they're just brief, but each of us, the pastors go into the classrooms and have these same devotions with kids yeah. in the classroom. And we're just trying to share that with you, uh, with you as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, any other announcements that you can think of? Um, no, not off the top of my head. Uh, uh, no, no, my, my midweek classes. Uh, come to a come to an, an end. So, uh, I think we covered everything. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, God bless you as uh, you move on from here. If you're heading to follow up here and watch, watch, uh, basically watch and participate in worship uh, through the stream. God bless you during your worship as Pastor Rushi brings you uh, God's good word uh, as as so beautifully shared in Philippians. And with that, we look forward to seeing you again. God be with you as you worship and as you run the race he's laid out for you this week. God's blessings. Bye-bye for now.